have you all back to another episode of Think Tech Wise Human Humane Architecture. We're broadcasting live once again from three different locations in the world, and we're still in the claws of COVID coronavirus. In addition to that, also in the uh, fist of feared fires, unfortunately, out there at the west coast of uh, mainland USA. Uh, our search is still, we hope when the smoke at some point has gone away that we can go back to what we started to discover, which are courtyard cabanas. And we're on the ongoing search for the more proletarian patio way. So let's get the first picture up. And us today, the three locations is back in Honolulu, Hawaii with you, DeSoto. Hi, DeSoto. How do you do? How do you do? I'm good, but more importantly, who's, don't we know someone out there out west, our best friend out there? Yes, we certainly do, and Ron, are you there? I am, thank you. Very good, so we have with us once again Edward Killingsworth, friend and business partner, Ronald Lindgren, thank you for joining us, and give us an update on what we see at, at the picture at the bottom right which is what you see in real out there and what you smell in real. Well, for wherever you, your viewers might be viewing this program, bottom right is a picture of uh, almost being able to see Los Angeles. Frankly, the city hasn't had such se severe smog conditions for 26 years. Indisputably, global climate change has led to drought, outer weather, and of course the forests are parched and dry and they're very easy to ignite. And to date, the fires have raised all across our state uh, to the tune of 3.4 million acres. Now that's a little bit larger than the, the state of New Jersey. And as compared to last year, which was a bad fire season, it's 27 times larger than what burned last year. So uh, what a calamity. Tens of thousands of structures, entire communities, dozens of lives have all been lost in California, Oregon, and Washington State. And at the same time, firefighters in 14 other Western states are having to battle their own tragic wildfires. The picture on the left happens to be the view that I have in my home across the street to a, uh, a nicely landscaped hillside. And my nightmare, of course, is that those eucalyptus trees on the hillside might become firewood. Oh, boy. We yeah, hope let's so. hope not. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And while we already saw on the previous slide a lot of more nature than architecture or retaining wall, that continues here. And let me share with you that my father's generation um, and uh, the ones before, um, they were mid-century, um, they were amazed when all these images of the case study house series were washing um, uh, ashore here uh, to, to Europe. And uh, it was made majorly, um, again, this um, John Intenza initiated program that was um, for Europeans just just amazing. And so um, later on, they were all combined into this publication by a German publisher that you had the chance to get to know in person, this photo, right? Yes, Benedict Toshin, who is the head of the same the company of the same name, who publishes an array of amazing art books, architecture books, etc. And here's a book published by Toshin yeah. on the Case Study House series. Yeah, and the hand you see in the in the picture uh, below that is is Ed's hand, Ed Killingsworth's hand, where in the interview uh, YouTube with Harvey Keller, he very proudly pointed out this book uh, that he was very happy to be in. And what was so refreshingly new uh, for us Europeans was that we had until then more or less adopted our fellow islanders, uh, the, the British uh, Victorian house, which has an Im impressive front, but it's not always as equally impressive when you proceed through that front and get into the house. Uh, Americans mid-century have almost been turning this upside down and making the street fronts uh, very, uh, uh, almost inapparent architecturally, 
And maybe you kick in here, Ron, what they were presenting itself, which we see at the very bottom left. Yeah, uh, at the bottom left is actually my home. It's nearly concealed from view by, uh, as you can see, trees, bamboo groves, and other dense landscaping. And uh, Ed Kellingsworth often said, and he was serious, that most houses deserve to be concealed completely by landscaping. <laughs> and we can even say at the bottom right, even the Frank House, which is one of the famous ones of, of Ed's contribution to the case study, how serious, as we see here, is flanked by these more Victorian houses that probably would deserve what Ed was saying, to be camouflaged, you know, by vegetation. So you don't see the Victorian approach. But tell us more about the case study house approach of keeping the facade so opaque and almost austere, what was the reason for that, Ron? Uh, it, it just happened to find that sort of uh, architectural appearance to be uh, the most elegant and classical because he was such, such a classicist. And so uh, that is certainly the, the primary reason. Yeah, but what we also find is that you don't spend a lot of your time trying to impress the outside world and show off the front of the house, but you live on the inside and not not enclosed because you've got open spaces, you've got gardens, and you've got atriums, and you've got courtyards. Indeed. Ron, you want to talk about what looks like the, a T-shirt up there? The <laughs> colorful thing in the top middle? Yeah, uh the, the upper middle picture, uh, you know an architect like Ed Killingsworth has really made his mark when his name appears on, in this case, some design merchandise. This is a striking example where Dwell Magazine, a very popular home design magazine, offered this graphic T-shirt for sale. Uh, the Killingsworth name, as you'll see, is emblazoned on it in very perfect company with such design luminaries as Le Cabrizier, and I never thought I'd see a T-shirt that had those names on it, like they were designer clothing names or something like that. <laughs> so from here on, let's move to the next slide, and I hope you invite us further into your house, Ron. Yes. Yeah, what, I'd, what I'd like to say is that we're talking about uh, a proletarian version of what have now become extremely expensive case study houses to buy. Uh, the typical case study houses that have survived for 15 and 60 years are going for billions of dollars. Uh, but its influence was so strong that contractors uh, were uh, motivated to pick up all kinds of pieces from a Kingsworth house because they, they were so impressed and put them in homes for uh, people like myself, part of the proletariat. When Ed's elder son, Ed, offered me this duplex for sale in 1973, I really jumped at the opportunity because, as I said, the contractor who had designed, developed, and built the entire development that the house was in was really heavily influenced by Ed Killingsworth's iconic early modern residential architecture. As the old saying goes, imitation is the highest form of flattery. So in successfully creating an approximation of a Killingsworth home, the developer contractor artfully copied some Killingsworth features. And I'll go through them rather quickly. As you can see in the exterior, the home is a crisp rectilinear structure with flat roofs. There are exposed wood columns and beams which are a reflection of Killingsworth structural expressionism. The interior spaces, which in my house comprised a tidy 1,220 square feet, are developed over two stories between two solid sidewalls, so I've got visual and acoustic privacy for my neighbors. This is one of Ed's tropes for doing many tenants with houses in dense, uh, densely populated areas. The two-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath home has an open plan. Only a second bedroom and the bathrooms can be closed off by doors. Indoor-outdoor living is achieved by access through two-story glass window walls, the front and rear trellis courtyards. 
a great interest uh, in terms of easy breezy is that that sort of living is achieved here by the inclusion of screen adjustable glass louvers in all of those glazed two-story walls and windows, which also occur between shade trellises. Uh, the home's orientation is is absolutely ideal, as the front elevation that we're looking at faces due south, it's, it's under 12 feet of trellis shading. But the rear elevation, which faces north, allows a flood of unshaded natural light into a two-story portion of the living room. One last comment, all interior doorways extend from the floor to the ceiling. And I guess I could also say that looking at these two, two photographs, Ed always wanted arrival experiences to any building to be memorable, so that you know to a came to a special place. So an especially memorable arrival experience is provided here by this garden walk, which wins its way to lush landscaping, to a two-story courtyard, and an impressive pair of eight-foot-tall entry doors, which makes moving furniture very easy. The closer one gets to these doors, the more architecture is revealed. Did you just so to recall, however, the most extreme of that, the Frank House's uh, <laughs> door being, what, 30 feet, Ron, tall? Uh, 17 feet. That, that, uh, that Boeing had to help out. And we were saying here, well, you were sharing with us that, that Ed had that thing with the tall doors because he was a short guy. In consequence, we can say, you being that tall guy, this door here probably isn't that tall. That's probably why. <laughs> Well, if you look at the next slide, you can see me standing in front of one of those two doors open. Uh, it, and also up on the upper right, uh, it's wonderful again to see one, one of his earliest houses, the Optal House of 1953, which I think created the finest sort of uh, garden sanctuary between two solid walls that, that Ed ever managed to create. Uh, this might also be time just to jump in quickly to talk a little bit about the fact that uh, my home doesn't stand by itself. Uh, it's within a very well-planned and handsome community development where several hundred people live. It's located along an oval roadway cul-de-sac, which before 1968 was a 1-8 mile horse racing practice track. But when the horse racing left in 68, the road was built where the practice track was. There are 40 buildings, every one of which contains duplex living units placed around and within that oval. And the one and two story units, with either flat or gable roofs, are all designed as courtyard homes. I repeat, courtyard. Each has a garden entry, such as the one that I'm standing in front of. Some also had an interior courtyard as a private outdoor room. The, the developer and designer provided four standard plans for the duplex, all of which emphasize open interiors and indoor outdoor living. And they were all facilitated by floor to ceiling fixed glass and sliding glass doors. Because all of the homes are built of common wood framing, glass wood, they all share similarities of an exterior appearance, and that helps to foster a sense of a community. In the magic of the 1960s, all of the duplex houses are all electric homes. And in that same spirit, they don't have any bathtubs, only showers. Communally, at each end of the other roadway, one building site has been left open so as to create parks, with lawns and shade trees, and pre-COVID, they were actively used for picnics, parties, and especially for playing with children and dogs uh, in the grass. And hey. I think we can go to, to the next slide. Take us on a slide over your house now. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah, wow. kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would say one thing about that last slide. We don't need to go back to it, but Ed Chelsea, of course, would have added some kind of water feature, a reflecting pool or something, to heighten that experience. That was a bit much for uh, a regular contractor to, to swallow. So what I did in lieu of that was place a whole line of statues, Buddhist and Hindu deities that I picked up over the years along the garden walk to provide that interest. But uh, the, the picture that we're now looking at, I did have two shady courtyards at grade, which I use all the time. 
But originally, I lacked exposure to the sun. So myself, I created a south-facing terrace on the roof of my, my one-car garage. My home was two stories high as far as the interior living spaces, but the garage out front was one story. And I accessed, accessed that uh, rooftop through a new door from my study, which is actually a second bedroom. But because of the often searing intensity of this southern sun exposure, the plants that this picture shows are basically all artificial. Uh, the terrace is furnished with artificial grass on which that longest chair is placed, a grove of six artificial trees, all eight feet tall, and to the left, a cascade of artificial lines from a strip of planter boxes. And those planter boxes sort of remind us of the picture up on the upper right where such planter boxes were used by my design partner and good friend Larry Stricker for the original Easy Lonely Hotel. To great effect. And almost every other Killingsworth project, the the, the planted troughs uh, are really a signature feature of the Killingsworth uh, body of work, right? Indeed. Next slide. This uh, terrace, which I've affectionately dubbed the Hanging Gardens of Lindgren, is a spot for me to someday at noon and also spend a lot of time in those cool early morning and late afternoon hours out there reading. And uh, as one who, who really is interested in furniture design, especially mid-century modern furniture design, I've got the classic Richard Schultz chaise to the right, but there I am sitting uh, on a reproduction of one of the Leap King's chairs, uh, a, an English uh, designer of uh, great fame, who in fact made his uh, his reputation from his work in Australia. But this is a very classic garden chair. And the next slide. The, this pine shaded outdoor space is a rear walled courtyard. And nicely enough, the contractor had built a wood shade structure over it. That constant movement of those striped shadows that this creates enlivens this garden room. And this is yet another feature shared with Killingsworth's early homes and office building. So, Senator, you wanted to mention something about uh, loft houses. Exactly. And when I look at this, it's a real architectural feature. And, and one of the really strong elements of this is, as you said, the moving shadows, the very strong contrast of the shade and the light. But this really comes from a utilitarian structure, a lap house, which was built, um, and it's a traditional thing that's been in use in a lot of places, for potted plants. And by having this stripy roof open, alternating open and closed spaces, you cut the solar radiation by 50% for plants that cannot be in the full sun all the time. And so while it was meant to grow plants. In the Killingsworth um, vein, it really is a feature, as you said, of some of his structures that turns into something that not only cuts down on the solar heat and radiation, but is a real feature of the Killingsworth appearance. Yeah, well, work for people, might as well work exactly. as well for, for plants and vice versa. Right. But talking uh, talking creatures, uh, who we see a new acquisition of yours at the very bottom right. Share us who that is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the bottom right picture is shows again how the contractor, uh, in, in very uh, adulation of uh, Ed Taylor's with architecture, has exposed structures, columns, and beams. It just happens that... Uh, my latest acquisition of uh, interesting deities is a Buddhist bodhisattva playing the flute, and he's joined me up there on the Hanging Gardens of Lindbergh. I might say also that at the, at the upper right is an example of Ed's perhaps finest use of trellis ceilings over two-story gardens, and these were providing views and privacy for uh, workers in a very slim two-story all-glass pavilion. And adding to your collection of classic furniture, uh, obviously here is Herbert Tyre's wire chair, 
but you're also very collegial to uh, uh, to a Californian colleague here in the back, right? Yeah, my my house is kind of a, a showcase for furniture made by just about everyone that has been famous for, for furniture. Everything from Eames to all of those Corbu chairs, these tables, you name it. But out here in my rear shady courtyard to the very uh, left, there's a kind of a twisted form, which is a side table by the great California architect, Frank Gehry. And it looks like a miniature version of what he's famous for doing in full-size buildings. Yeah, here's like a building and just twist it. <laughs> <laughs> and there you have it, a twisted side table by Frank Gehry. <laughs> And last but slide. not at all least, your hammock there, right? That's like the ultimate lounging in a right. covered patio. Yeah, that's that. That's where one dreams of post-COVID times. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. Next slide, Ron. Yeah. Uh, the uh, at the right is probably Ed Sheeran's most, most elegant outdoor room. Again, uh, covered with, covered by 50% by these space with trellis numbers. Uh, and this very elegant room was entered from a single front door uh, surrounded by water uh, that was 17 feet tall and only the Boeing aircraft company could actually make it. But to the left, uh, there's a fragment of a statue reproduction that I'm showing, and it sort of amply shows that the Hindu concept of an angel on the left as being a voluptuous dancer really contrasts sharply with the Christian notion that all angels are sexless beings wrapped head to toe in flowing robes. <laughs> Yeah, and outside you can see beyond the sexy angel is that same lath-roofed um, courtyard that we just saw a picture of. Indeed. I, I have all of the advantages of indoor-outdoor living in a proletarian structure designed and built by a contractor that people have, very luckily, in real Killingswood homes. Yeah, yeah and, and while, in, while in the Frank house... Um, that that trellis is two story above you. You only have it one story above you in the outdoor living room. But yes, go to the next slide. Surprise, surprise! The proletarian version has something that the Frank House has, which we see here, right? What a luxury! Yeah, yeah here's the view of the two story portion of the living room. Uh, in fact, the second half of the 30 foot wide living room, which we've been seen on the left is tucked under the open master bedroom. But you can see that the two, there, there are four vertical uh, sections of glass. The two outside are fixed glass, but the two inside, all the way from floor to ceiling, consists of adjustable glass louvers, clear glass louvers. I can reach up to them with a, a special tool that I was provided with the house to open them even up near the, uh, near the ceiling. And when you do open the ones up near the ceiling, you get natural convection. Again, more of that easy breezy uh, living. And to the right, uh, I have access to the uh, second floor where the bedrooms are located, two bedrooms, by an open spiral uh, staircase with teak treads. And it leads to a bridge, which in turn leads into a uh, ability to go right or left into the bedrooms. You can see that that bridge is actually wide enough that I could furnish it with the James Reeson rocking uh, uh, chair, which is an, another great place to read. But notice, too, how doors, both access doors in the center and a closet door on the far right, all run from floor to ceiling. And this greatly adds to a sense of spaciousness within my house. Absolutely. Next slide. Yeah, here uh, I've had great luck of taking many business trips, sometimes solo, sometimes with Ed Killingsworth, sometimes with other partners, uh, throughout large portions of Southeast Asia. And that's where I fully encountered Buddhist and Hindu culture. And I was so impressed by those artistic traditions 
that I brought home that were always very serene sculptural images of their many deities and their mythical creatures. And so I've displayed them in the garden settings, as you, as you see here. To the left is a, a Buddha. To the right is a Chinese goddess of mercy, a Buddhist uh, deity called uh, Kuan Yin. And they're also interspersed inside the house in all of my home's interiors, including the garage, which doubles as a gallery filled with Japanese print reproductions. So uh, the home has been a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, add interesting art that means a lot to me uh, all throughout uh, the premises. And I, what I like is that they, that they are both inside and outside, which really emphasizes that this is an inside-outside living space. Yes. And we got to rush, so let's rush through the last uh, type of courtyard on the next slide, which is the third yeah, what I, what, kind of what, what I'll say quickly is that I, I have outdoor access to both my front and rear gardens, so I don't have to go to the house and drive uh, you know, hoses and, and gardening equipment. And it's through a walled linear courtyard. Uh, and that garden sculpture, uh, again, in terms of being proletariat, is actually made up of five stools that I bought at Walmart that I just stacked on top of each other for about a couple hundred dollars. Getting uh, a ceramic landscape uh, piece of art, a sculpture like that costs thousands of dollars. Uh, to the right is just a quick view out from my entry garden and looking out across the street. You know, I personally, I find that only the combination of graceful architecture and the lush landscaping that the contractor first provided and I added to and maintained, only that has provided me a true home and a refuge. And if we go to the last slide, I, I also want to say that gardens and my roses are a healthy bond for my soul, especially in these times, which are shared, as if I needed to remind everyone, with a deadly pandemic, brutal manifestations of global warming, a vicious election season in the United States, and extreme political partisanship. So why in the lower right-hand corner am I smiling out at you? Well, uh, to end on a more positive note, that all being true, because you're sharing with us something that will survive this and will help people uh, to um, stay literally and figuratively cool in courtyards. I think the achievement of your houses, Ron, is huge because the Killingsworth avant-garde that is so exquisite and excellent was brought to the masses, made it mainstream. And, you know, we were talking before the show, besides, so you remember Poulet Circle, which is a rare example that we yet have to do a show about and why yes. that hasn't been so much the case that really the mainstream has tried to live up to the same exquisite, excellent standards than the, the super avant-garde. Right. So with that, uh, we that reminded us of, of the topic of the next show because there's one developer who had made a business model out of that and his name was Joseph Eichler. And we want to share uh, our thoughts about that and encourage you to join us. Yep. So that being said, until then, please, as said, please stay literally and figuratively cool if possible in your courtyard. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.